Okay, can I get the slides? First of all, I want to thank very much uh, Dr. Kim for inviting me here and also Sujin Park. We spent some good time together in Los Angeles and so it's really nice to see her again. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize if I speak a little fast uh, and it may be difficult to catch up. I have a lot of material and I didn't realize we're going to have to keep to our time here. So I just want to say no, uh, I have nothing to declare over here. Other than this talk about double outer ventricle, which really is not just one defect, but a majority of a number of different things that combine together. But really, I think we can define it as an uh, entity in which both great arteries arise completely or predominantly from the right ventricle. And the thing is that it's no, interesting about it is there's so much variety, I think all of us know that, that there can be multiple combinations, there can be multiple physical, physiologic presentations, anywhere from a VSD to a tetralogy flow or 3D transposition of the great arteries. Not only that, but DORV may not be the primary diagnosis. It may be part of a much larger group of abnormalities, heterotaxy, crisscross, heart, congenital corrective transposition. So it really depends on how you look at it. Is, it. is it the primary lesion or is it just part of a major complex of lesions? But for the par uh, purpose of this talk, I'm going to talk mainly about DORV as a primary defect. Now, I work in great detail with one of the great cardiac surgeons in, in, in all of the world, Dr. Starnes. And so, you know, it's really, when you, when you do that, you actually have to understand this heart lesion, not only from an anatomic pathologic basis, but also from a surgical basis, too, because all DORV patients are going to require surgery, or virtually all of them will. And therefore, the type of surgery depends upon the anatomy. So therefore, when you do a complete evaluation of DORV, you always have to keep in mind what is the surgery, what's the underlying surgery that needs to be done. So you have to know what type of surgeries are, what type of defect it is, and what, if you can, what type of surgery, what can you do, and what kind of information do you need to be able to make the optimal decision there. Not all DORV patients, unfortunately, even though they have two ventricles, can undergo a two ventricle repair. Although nowadays, given the, all the long -term and longer term data with single ventricle palliation, which I'm sure we'll hear about in other lectures too, the fundamental premise is now emerging that whenever possible, two ventricle circulation should be the preferred option. Obviously, it depends upon the surgical skill and experience at any given institution, but really I think that's the way we're going now more than anything else. So the question then is, if we do believe that we, th if we really want to go for two ventricle pair, the number one thing is, are there two ventricles? Are they normal in size, apex forming? What is their condition? What is the function? And what do the AV valves look like? And I think Dr. Yu was talking a little about that, so I'm not going to talk too much about AV valves, but remember that AV valves are very important. Then the other question is, where is the VSD and where is it in relation to the great arteries? And what is the relationship of the AV valves to the, AV, the VSD and the great arteries too? Now the AV valves are very important in this, and do they straddle and could they potentially interfere with ventricular baffling? What about the conus and the conal septum? We talked about outlet septum, conal septum, it's pretty much the same thing. And we really need to know this. Do not forget about the conal septum. Dr. Yu talked about that. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And of course, any other important anatomic features. Now, uh, the thing is, like I said, is you really have to know what are the important surgical procedures. And this is a list that I'm not going to go into detail, but these are a list of some of the potential surgeries that can be done but depending on what type of cardiac, uh, what type of DORV you have. And I think it's always really important for us to keep in mind what is the type of defect and what might be the surgery and what type of information do we need to establish which surgery can be done. And if, if there are other procedures that might need to be done as well. Now, in our institution, 2D echo is the foundation of anatomic and physiologic assessment of DORV because of the following. And I think Sujin taught, touched upon this, highest resolution of the, all the imaging modalities, real-time assessment of anatomy, function, and physiology using color flow and spectral Doppler. And the only thing about 2D echo is you need multiple tomographic sweeps with various windows to understand 3D anatomy. We use 3D echo sometimes to uh, clarify 3D relationships. I'm going to show a little bit of that, too, because I want to sort of show that a little bit more. And we also use CT and MRI, but I think to, le uh, to lesser basins than Dr. Yu does over in Toronto to try and quantify volumes, function, and look at systemic and pulmonary venous anomalies. The VSD is probably the number one thing you want to focus on over here. Really, what is it? Is it a malalignment type of VSD that Dr. Yu talked about? That's the most common type of VSD you're going to see with DORV. If so, what is its shape and size, and is there more than one? Obviously, if you have a Swiss cheese type of septum, that's going to change things a little bit as opposed to if you just have one. Now, the most common classification schema, and the one I will use from this point onward, is where is the VSD in relation to the great arteries? And so if you take four basic kind of buckets that you put the D over IRVs in, and I think all of us know this, they're either subaortic, subpulmonary, doubly committed, or non-committed. 
And the VSD relationship with the great arteries is based not only in VSD type, but also great artery position and the conal septum, its length and, or length and orientation and insertion to the septal band. Now this is very important, and Dr. Yu touched upon this too, is that here we have, and I just kind of schematically drew this, this is a VSD, and it really depends on where your conal septum is. Now here's the limbs of septal band here, trabecular septum marginalis, and if your conal septum is attached to the leftward limb, leftward more anterior limb, kind of malaligns that way, then you can have significant subpulmonary stenosis, such as the tetralogy form of DORV, which we'll talk about, with a subaortic VSD. Notice the VSD is closest to the aorta. On the other hand, you have a rightward malalignment or, uh, or position of the whole right conal septum over here to, and attaches to the rightward limb of septal band over here, even though the VSD may be very similar in terms of its look, then you have sub stenosis, you have a subpulmonary VSD, and you have more of the Tazi Bing type of DORV. These are, so these are the four different types we'll talk about, subaortic, subpulmonary, doubly committed, and non-committed VSD, and I hope I have time to talk about all of them. I'll try my best. First, with subaortic VSDs, which are the most common type of DORVs, this is usually a malalignment type of VSD related to the aortic valve. Usually the aorta is posterior and rightward, but maybe side by side. The aortic valve may form the roof of the VSD, or there can be complete discontinuity between the aortic valve and the VSD, and a muscular rim surrounding the VSD entirely. Usually seen in the setting of so quote unquote normally related great arteries, but it may not be that way. And the conal septum, like I said, is attached to the anterior and leftward limb of septal band. And there may or may not be subpulmonary stenosis depending on the degree of infundibular hypoplasia. So this is the more common type that we see a lot of, and this is the TET type of DORV, in which case you actually see a subpulmonary stenosis over here. You see the conal septum attached to the, land, uh, the leftward ant uh, and anterior rim of, uh, limb of, con of, uh, of uh, septal band. This is the aortic valve coming, completely coming off the aortic valve. And so this, you can see that this is a DORV, but with subpulmonary stenosis over here and a subaortic VSD, it's committed there. This is an echo here, and I will try and move over this quickly. This is the VSD, here is the aortic valve, the 2D echo, this is from sub xiphoid view. And as we scan a little anterior, you can barely even see the pulmonary al alpha track. It's gonna be right up in this area over here. With a little bit of conal septum here, you can see because of the fact that the aorta is completely over the right ventricle, or almost completely over, it really is quite uh, anterior, both the uh, aorta and of course the pulmonary artery here. There's a subpulmonary area here. I'm gonna move very quickly across this because I don't have a lot of time. So here's a VSD, here's a subpulmonary area, and the pulmonary valve over here. And you can really see that they both, they, they both come off of the right ventricle here. Here's the VSD, here's the aorta, completely off the right ventricle, and the pulmonary valve will be just to the left of it and anterior. So this looks like a tetralogy of flow. It's a matter of degree. The aorta is just way, uh, it's completely off the right ventricle. There's this, the subpulmonary area, and we'll show the color flow Doppler in just a moment here too. You'll see I'll have a lot more echo clips here because I'm an echo person here. And this is a the 3D echo, and we use this sometimes too. Here's the LV, here's the RV, here's the aortic valve, here's the VSD. And you can kind of see right over here as we change different views here, there's the aortic valve, and you can see the discontinuity between the aortic valve and the mitral valve. There's the aortic valve, and as we kind of sweep a little bit more anteriorly, there's a pulmonary valve, significant subaortic stenosis, a hypoplasia of the infundibulum that they often talk about. Really, you can see here's the conal septum, how narrow it is. There's the VSD here. Here's the aortic valve on the other side. So this is a very useful look because it kind of looks like a, a pathologic specimen, but it's in motion. It's 4D motion over here, which is quite nice. Now, you can also have subaortic VSD without pulmonary stenosis, and this is an example of one over here. So in this case, the difference between this case and the last case is there's much more development of the subpulmonary infundibulum. Therefore, you don't have the subpulmonary stenosis like you do with the other type of case. Uh, Dr. Inf Dr. Uh, <coughs> Van Prague, who I worked with back in Boston, always talked about this as a monology of Stenson, really, really dependent on the degree of infundibular hypoplasia that occurred. And so if you have no infundibular hypoplasia, or very little, then you don't have the uh, potential for subpulmonary stenosis. So these patients, of course, will behave more like a VSD. So here we have a, I don't have a 2D of it, but I do have a uh, 3D here, and so here's the VSD. Now notice that you have a conal septum, but you have a much more well-developed infundibulum over here, and therefore you don't have subpulmonary stenosis like you did with the last one. Here it is over here, so here's the pulmonary valve. There's still an anteriorly malign conal septum that attaches to the leftward limb of septal band, but really, again, the infundibulum is much larger, and therefore, there is no pulmonary, subpulmonary stenosis. This patient is not gonna behave like a tetralogy flow. It's not gonna be cyanotic, quite the opposite. This patient's probably gonna be in a fair amount of heart failure. So we're just rotating this around. There's the VSD itself here. There's the septal band here. 
and you can see this, and then there's a pulmonary valve, aortic valve right over here. Both of those similar valves are on the right-hand side. This aortic valve is really completely over. There's the VSD itself right there as we rotate that around. And so the differences between the two is just to show this in comparison. There is a subpulmonary stenosis there. There's a hypoplastic infundibulum. Here's a well-developed infundibulum and much less subpulmonary stenosis. Since the VSD is aligned with the aorta, theoretically the LV can be valved from the VSD to the aorta, and therefore one important question is whether the pulmonary outflow tract will need to be open like a tetralogy flow. And that's the real question over there when you're looking at that from tetralogy flow. Subpulmonary VSDs. We're going to talk about subpulmonary VSDs, and this is really the one we talk about, subtalsic being type of DRV. Uh, usually there is a, some degree of pulmonary valve override, usually about at least 50 to 60 percent. The aorta is rightward, and there's hypoplasia of the systemic outflow structures, which is important because these patients will present as ductal-dependent lesions, systemic ductal dependence, and therefore be PGE-dependent. They kind of look like this over here, as I showed before. The conal septum is rightward and aligned, and then you've got this VSD underneath the pulmonary valve here. And this is from our own collection here. We can actually see here's the conal septum attached to the rightward limb. There's a tricuspid valve with attachments to the conal septum here. This is going to be a 3D, and I'm just going to go through this quickly because, I'm, I, like I said, I'm trying to uh, manage my time here. There's the wide septal band, the conal septum, and you can kind of see this kind of, and this is the aortic valve over here with a 3D. This is the, the, this is the VSD over here, the wide septal band right over here. Here's the tricuspid valve. And you can see right over here, that's the subaortic area, and this is the reason why a lot of times these patients have problems, that there's very narrow outflow to the aorta, in fact, the aortic valve is only a bicuspid valve over here. This is on the other side of it. Here's the conal septum, the tricuspid valve. Here is a very hypoplastic aortic arch. Obviously, this patient would have been ductal dependent with a coarctation as well. And this, is, this kind of shows you the uh, pulmonary valve just overriding the, uh, the Y of septal band, which we're going to show right over here. There's a septal band, the conal septum attached to the rightward limb, and this will be the subaortic area. I'm going to move on just a little bit more more because, I, I, like I said, I, I want to get to other things too. This is just a 3D that shows how this pulmonary valve overrides. And look how the conal septum, as, he, as Dr. Yu talked about, it looks like a door, just hinged at one side. And then this kind of shows the VSD. These are the, the mitral valve leaflets there. There's a pulmonary valve here. There's a the ventricular septum there and the left ventricle right here. Since the VSD is aligned with the pulmonary artery, obviously this patient is going to need an arterial switch operation uh, if, uh, because of the fact there's significant subaortic stenosis. So do it need an arterial switch operation and may need an aortic arch repair. So slightly a much different operation than the previous one and a, probably a little more complicated because a lot of them have coronary artery anomalies too. Doubly collimated VSDs. So we've gone through subpulmonary, subaortic, and now doubly collimated VSDs are much, uh, much less common. They're due to the hypoplasia of the outlet or conal septum with variable degrees of override of the VSD. The similar valves re represent a lot of times the anterior superior margin of the VSD, and often the limbs of the septal band represent the posterior inferior margin. Usually no obstruction to flow across either art great artery, but you can have some subpulmonary stenosis. So showing a picture again from uh, uh, Wyman Lies tex textbook, you see the deficiency of any conal septum, large VSD, and really is committed to both great arteries, aortic and pulmonary artery. You could really baffle to either one. This is another really nice example of this from Voss and Adams' book here. Again, the absence of conal septum, and then you can see that this VSD is really underneath both great arteries here. And here there's a little bit of pulmonary stenosis too. This sort of shows a doubly committed VSD here. This is uh, with a uh, subxiphoid view, and you can see here's the pulmonary valve, there's the aortic valve. And what's nice about this, sorry, I want to check my time and see how much I have left here. But uh, you can see right over here is that there's flow going from the VSD really to both parts. Now, with this particular view, you may not be able to see it quite as well. There's the aortic valve, there's a the pulmonary valve. The VSD is right over here, but let me just take you to another, a few other views here, which are really useful. Here you can see the aortic valve, pulmonary valve, no conal septum at all. And in fact, when we go to the peristernal short axis, long axis view, here's the pulmonary valve here. The aortic valve will be over here, and there will be no, there's really no conal septum in between the two at all. They're really in fibrous continuity with each other. Here it is in short axis. Here's the aortic valve. There's a point. I'll notice the absence of conal septum at all. There is some turbulence across the pulmonary valve, which I think is probably flow-related. There's potential for some subaortic narrowing in this particular case, but this patient did not have a conal, did not have a coarctation. So you can really see how significantly, you know, how the, um, the VSD, which is really a little bit below, can go to either the aorta pulmonary artery. 
And a 3D echo to show this as well. This is aortic valve, this is pulmonary valve. And there's the VSD, and you can see an absence of conal septum. So you can see here's the VSD. You could really baffle to either one. And sometimes the challenge is to be able to know, determine is it truly a doubly committed or is it a non committed VSD? Because sometimes the VSD is so far below that it may not actually be able to be baffled to either one. But this is going to be really important. Here's the aortic valve here, here's the pulmonary valve. It's a little bit narrower. And you can see there's no conal septum so that this VSD could easily be baffled to either one, but to the aortic valve would be probably be a more natural thing. Here is the VSD again. Here it, go, here it looks like you could go to either valve, but there's a pulmonary valve here too. And really, there's no roof at all except for the two semilunar valves. So it's quite nice to be able to show that. And here are the two, two, two AV valves here. Now, to correct this, of course, would require an intracardiac baffle from the left ventricle to the aortic valve and envisioning a pathway from the LV to the aorta and the RV to pulmonary artery. However, you have to be careful of a number of things, including the fact, is there inter any intervening AV valve tissue? And what is the position related to the VSD? There could be a potential for significant alpha tract narrowing of either the LV alpha tract or potentially the pulmonary alpha tract too. And one might have to consider other types of surgical strategies, such as a USUI type of procedure or a STELI procedure, in which, in which case you'd have to ligate the pulmonary artery and do an RV to PA conduit. So again, keeping in mind the surgical possibilities. Finally, and probably the most problematic of all, is non-committed remote VSDs, which aren't that common, but it is really very important. There's a long distance from, to either great artery, semilunar valve. More than, you, that's, uh, some people talk about more than one aortic valve diameter from the VSD to, the, to either the aortic valve point valve. The VSDs are usually not malalignment. They're usually perimembranous, inlet, mid-muscular, or apical, sometimes AV canal type VSDs. In some cases of malalignment, there are a malalignment VSD, there's such prominent conus that it actually redirects the blood, for, uh, keeps the blood from going to either elementary valve very well. There can be intervening AV valve tissue. The VSDs can be small and be restrictive, and they can actually also be quite dynamic. And depending upon conal anatomy, there may be alpha track obstruction. This is uh, an example of a very remote VSD. This obviously is very, very far away from either semilunar valve and probably would not be a two-ventricle two candidate. This is going to show very quickly a perimembranous VSD over here, just showing the VSD. Here's the pulmonary valve with some pulmonary stenosis, aortic valve. It's really, the VSD is quite low, and again, you have to kind of think of it in a three-dimensional way. I think this is where other types of modalities, such as 3D echo, and also using uh, some 3D printed material or CT angio or MR might help here. This is an example of a, a, a remote VSD. Here is a VSD, and I wanted to point out one thing here. Look how dynamic that VSD is, how it's squeezing and closing with systole and diastole. You really wouldn't know this until you actually looked at this with uh, some type of dynamic imaging technique. The surgeon actually had to go and resect the VSD, actually open it up because it was so narrow and potential obstruction. Here's the aortic valve. There's the pulmonary valve. This VSD is pretty far away from either one, so what the surgeon did, it could have gone to either one, but actually went to the aortic valve and just put a patch over here and just left the RV to PA going the way it was. So this actually worked out pretty well. But you can see how far this is and how you can get into real trouble if you're not careful with these patients. These are the most problematic patients. Two minutes. To yes, move. thank you. Uh, VSDs are too, may, may be too small, too remote from either similar valve, and potential for significant sub reduction if the VSD patches used to baffle the LV to the aorta due to the small convoluted sub uh, pathway. Intervening AV valve tissue may be a problem as well. Sometimes you have to actually move things, so a nikaido repair is something that one can consider if there's a pulmonary valve that's closer to the left ventricle. In some cases, a, a, a two-ventricle repair cannot be achieved. This is an example of an, here, one patient over here. With a double alloy ventricle, here are the two AV valves, and I wanted to show you this both in uh, 2D imaging, which you can see here. It's already problematic, but I think 3D really makes it dramatic here, too, as you can see. Here are the two AV valves here. Here's the tricuspid valve. Here's the mitral valve, aortic valve, and pulmonary valve here. And you can see there's a long way to go from either one. This patient really was not a two-ventricle candidate uh, based on a lot of these, uh, this information information that we had here. And this is where I think 3D really helped out here. So um, I think I'm just going to finish up with over here and say that the other thing that you want to look for is uh, atrial septal other associated anomalies, which could play a role. For example, if you have venous abnormalities, IVC coming to a funny area that has to be, you know, has to be some type of intraatrial baffle, TAPVR, PPVR, these can complicate things as well too. So I think that's really important. So in summary, I think you really have to do an anat accurate anatomic and physiologic assessment of VSD position in relationship to the great arteries, AV valves, the size, competency, adequacy, and question straddling, alpha tract size and stenosis, and especially pay attention <coughs> excuse me, to the conal septum. 
and ventricular adequacy, you always want to keep in mind, you really want to start thinking like a surgeon about what type of surgical repair will be done and what are the important, what's the information you need to give. And again, I like 2D echo because I think it's so, so very useful, but the other modalities are sometimes important, just as important in being, in, able, in being able to really determine these things too. I thank you very much, and this is Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Appreciate your time.